did she study this? Like, why? Like, did she go to school for military history? Does she know? Like, did she study military? Why the fuck is she speaking about? Why is she talking about this? Like, actually, why is she talking about this? And I mean that in the like the most mean way possible. Breaking Points released a video about Bakhmut titled Media Lies About Ukraine's Defeat in Bakhmut. For those of you who don't know, Breaking Points is a podcast hosted by Crystal Ball. Uh, it is Crystal Ball, right? Yeah. Crystal Ball and Seeger. Uh, Seeger is like the conservative. Crystal Ball is like the like the lefty. And it's supposed to be like a yin and yang podcast. Uh, and their takes on the war in Ukraine have not been great. I've covered it on the channel before. And now they just released a video about the fall of Bakhmut, which there hasn't been a lot of great coverage about the fall of Bakhmut. I think the Kiev Independent wrote the best piece summarizing the last 15 months of, of fighting and of a slugfest that was the battle of Bakhmut. And I would recommend you guys look at that because it also talks about the localized Ukrainian counteroffensives to the north and to the south of the city that are surprising that is it's even possible in the first place since they're not even using the new units that have been mustered up by the Ukrainian armed forces trained by uh, either the United States, the UK, or themselves in preparation for the counteroffensive. So it's just localized units that have been involved in the defense of Bakhmut causing this pressure on the north and south flanks. Anyway, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm diverting a little bit back to this. I wanted to listen to, to what they had to say about the fall of Bakhmut because my conclusion of the fall of Bakhmut is the, the battle of Bakhmut uh, is a tragedy in the fact that it was such a bloody, bloody battle for a piece of territory that, of course, was meaningful to the 60 to 70,000 people who lived in Bakhmut itself before the war, before, of course, they all evacuated uh, outside of the few uh, civilians who rejected all type of evacuation and, and chose to stay. Uh, it is not that strategically important for this war. Nobody knew before this invasion happened what Bakhmut was. Up until about 10 months ago, most people who even were covering the war didn't know much about Bakhmut, except that, you know, it was another point on the, on the map. Uh, and that it maybe one day, you know, the fighting would get to Bakhmut and, that would, and, and they would fight over Bakhmut. Nobody thought it was going to be this big of a battle lasting for this long and with these many casualties because nobody saw it as a particularly important location. I mean, the Solidar salt, mi salt mines, which are to the north of Bakhmut, that's probably a more strategically important location based upon the fact that they can, you know, store units and supplies in the salt mines, which are a lot more protected from, say, Ukrainian artillery strikes. But Bakhmut itself is only a stepping stone. And so while you can talk about this being a victory for the Russians, uh, it's a very bittersweet victory in the fact that they've lost so many people, much more than the Ukrainians have when attacking to take the city as they had to fight in brutal uh, building to building, street to street, room by room combat to take these buildings, to take the city, uh, which led to them resorting to human wave tactics. Wagner resorting to taking their prisoner soldiers and just throwing them at these buildings, uh, which in many uh, cases, when they were finally abandoned by the Ukrainians, would be stuffed with explosives before going kaboom and taking the people who claimed the building uh, with them. Uh, it was an extremely bloody slugfest, and it led to the Russians being distracted for the entirety of the winter offensive just on Bakhmut. It led to them taking massive casualties. I mean, both sides took massive casualties, but it was more disproportionately towards the Russians. Now, maybe you could say it balances out because Russia has more people overall, but it was disproportionate towards the Russians. And now uh, it seems like, and this is what Gherkin talked about, Igor Gherkin talked about this recently, that this lays the groundwork for a Ukrainian counteroffensive as the Russians have spent their time pouring troops and ammunition into an attack on Bakhmut that wasn't that generally important for a PR victory when they could have been diverting these resources to prepare for Ukrainian counteroffensive or attack more strategically important locations along the front line. It's merely another stepping stone towards capturing the Donbass. Kramators and other locations, which they're still going to have to fight for in the future, are much more important. Yet all the resources are spent here. And so I think that's how Bakhmut should be talked about. You should look at what the Russian military bloggers are saying about the capture of Bakhmut. Outside of what Prigozhin and the Russian government saying, look at what the people in Russia 
who want to win the war are saying about this online. Many of them are saying they're happy they took it, but it cost too much. It shouldn't have been captured much earlier. And now we're fearful of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. We're, we're not so sure we're uh, prepared for this. And this is all happening. The little bit of PR effect they did get was just, was all happening. All these updates about this, about the fall of Bakhmut. We just get more updates of Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian backed Russian separatists, not Russian separatists, but uh, a uh, anti Putin Russians taking territory in Russia proper, undermining the propaganda value of Bakhmut. So there, there's, it is a victory for the Russians, but I think it needs to be talked about in, in the idea of like, it'd be like, if I'm from Maryland, it'd be like if if I said, oh, Annapolis, Maryland, it, it, it took the Chinese military 10 months to capture it. And they took casualties of like 40 to 50 to 60,000 people to capture the small city of not extreme strategic support importance. It would be an embarrassment for a lot of modern militaries. But because Russia is so hungry for a victory, they're now going to turn it into their Stalingrad, even though Stalingrad was a city of millions of people, not tens of thousands of people. And reminder here uh, that capturing Bakhmut is a much easier task than capturing Kramatorsk, which is going to be one of the main locations the Russians want to capture in the future if they want to reunite the rest of the Donbass, which is their current stated goal. Uh, no, no, we're not even talking about Zaporozhye or Kiev or any of these bigger cities, which they just completely failed to take. Um, but in the immediate future, the tasks are going to be even bigger ahead of them. Anyway, I've been rambling too much. Let's listen to what uh, Seeger and Crystal have to say. This. Let's go and put the next one up there on the screen. He was uh, asked, about, let's go to the next part here because it's so important, Crystal, is that this comes on the heels of a major loss for Ukraine. Although many people apparently are trying to spin it differently. The head of the Wagner Group, President Putin, um, have all come out and said that the eight-month struggle between Russia and Ukraine over the strategic city of Bakhmut is now over and that they are claiming full control of Bakhmut. Now, President Zelensky, to be clear, is denying this. Let's go and put the next one up there on the screen. He was uh, asked about it while he was in Hiroshima. He said, quote, though, that Russia's had fully controlled the city, or, or sorry, he denied that Russia fully controlled the city, but then said that there is nothing left but dead Russians who are in the city and that Bakhmut is only in our hearts because it has all been completely destroyed. Now, on that, I don't think there is any dispute. But I be am really beginning to feel like I'm losing my mind here, Crystal, because Zelensky poured billions of dollars of ammunition and artillery into this battle. The theory was... Wait, what, met wait, what metric are we using to measure that? Wait, can we actually, what is the metric for how much money was spent on specifically the battle for Bakhmut? How would we figure that out? I, I, I actually don't know. Like, because we, I, I've seen a lot of battles in this war, you know, in Battle for Mariupol, Battle for Kiev. I've seen a lot of them. And usually there's not like a big how much money spent on this battle. I don't think there's any way to even measure that. Um... Maybe there would be in some like Ukrainian headquarters, but if that information does exist, it's not publicly available, but I, I don't know. I, I'm sure they did spend a lot of money. I don't know if it was billions, like two to three billion dollars um, or four billion. I have no clue what that number would be, but I haven't again, like, I don't know. Well, we're going to keep killing as many Russians as possible. We're on the defensive. They're on the offensive. We can bleed them dry. This will be our stand. I mean, Am I the only guy who remembers that he literally bought a brought a Brockmut flag to Washington that was a signed Brockmut? Okay, whatever. by the guy? I, I mispronounced his name earlier. That's how important this victory was. Like it was, it was their battle of the bulge. Like it was their big turn point. What the fuck is he talking about? I'm sorry, man. There's so many. What the, I, what is he talking? It was their battle of the bulge. It was their big turning point. Who said this about Bakhmut? There's okay, so. I feel like the people who think they're the least susceptible to propaganda are sometimes the most susceptible to propaganda. If I was to ask this guy, do you think you're easily tricked by governments? Do you think you're easily like caught up in government narratives? Uh, everybody who's in the alt media sphere or everybody who would, I think, probably be a fan of the show would assume that they're very much not so. 
But if you look at the battle for Bakhmut, and as somebody who's spoken to people who have fought in Bakhmut, um, much of the narratives that are published out by both the Russians and the Ukrainians is just propaganda. Uh, the significance of Bakhmut uh, is not really that much, not that large. And I would ask him to define what the significance of Bakhmut to the Russians or to the Ukrainians is outside of a death trap. Bakhmut was turned into a death trap by the Ukrainians, where they wanted to stop the Russians from destroying other large cities uh, like Kramatorsk, uh, Kramator, Slovansk, Chasovyar. Chasovyar is smaller, but still they didn't want them to go into Chasovyar and to turn it into a death trap for the Russians who entered it, trying to, you know, hurt the Russians for every single inch they've taken. And when it comes to hurting the Russians for every single inch they've taken, they've achieved that. They've lost the city itself, but the idea that the Ukrainians ever thought that the battle would be won or lost at Bakhmut, or that it was their battle of the bulge, like this was their last ditch effort to save their country, is ridiculous. I don't think there's any military analyst who's ever recommended uh, Zelensky do this from his own uh, internal groups, from his own advisors, from international advisors, from any military historian, military scholars, anybody. Uh, I don't know where he got this narrative from outside of the fact that Zelensky talked about Bakhmut a lot. Bakhmut was brought up a lot because it did very well in the search algorithm. It's a very small city that has been basically ground into dust. Therefore, it got more attention because of how unbelievably devastated it looked and how fierce the fighting was there. But it was never their battle of the bulge. There was no Ukrainian attempt to use Bakhmut as a, you know, a jumping off point to push the Russians out. It was another city to try to grind the Russians down in which they did. They achieved that point of it, at least, even if they've lost the city themselves. And let me, let me give an example of this, because I think some people are, aren't realizing uh, the significance of Bakhmut in relation to other fights territorial-wise, when it comes to the, the usefulness of the land, not the uh, usefulness of being ground down or, or like the amount of people you can kill in a certain area. Uh, I think I made a post about this actually in response to Seeger. So let me bring up my Twitter quick, if I can. I think uh, I'm having problems with YouTube again. Let me pull this up. Because I think I, I quote tweeted him because he was saying something very similar on Twitter. Here it is. The last 72 hours have been the most insane media coverage of the Ukraine war in a while. There has been zero scrutiny on the following. Number one, Ukraine suffered a major battlefield loss. And I responded to this with this map. I love this map because this map, I think, perfectly shows exactly how media coverage can affect how we see the battlefield map. If you were to think about how much Bakhmut has been talked about, how much Bakhmut has been on the top of all the media headlines, how much the Russians have talked about it, how much, you know, Zelensky has hyped it up when he came to the United States. He talked about Bakhmut directly. When you think about how much it gets attention in comparison to how much territory is actually being fought over, it's insane. The Kharkiv counteroffensive is colored in green hair. A lot more territory was liberated during the Kharkiv counteroffensive than in the last 10 months of fighting that the Russians have been trying to crawl, like, like, like scratch and, and grab as much territory as they can. And they haven't been that successful in doing so. As you can see, as for what has been marked here as a complete collapse of the front, which shows Russian captures, uh, Russian territorial captures in the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. Now, to be clear, it's a little bit more red here. I think I would need to double the amount of red there. But when you compare that to the Kharkiv counteroffensive, to the Kherson counteroffensive, to the Ukrainian uh, uh, pushing the Russians out of uh, the Kiev Oblast and of the areas in northern Ukraine, if you compare it to any of these other operations, when it comes to the amount of useful territory or useful things captured, it's just not that significant. It's significant in the idea that a lot of people died, but when it comes for, to something strategically important being captured, Bakhmut is not that strategically important. It is no more strategically important than the next city to its right or the next city to its left or in front of it, outside of the fact that it's one more city between 
the Ukrainian population and a war of annihilation. I mean, look, and I don't say this with relish, they just lost a major battle of attrition. Now, everyone in the media is trying to spin it and they're like, oh, this is- Wait, and can we just say, when we say lost a major battle of attrition, I think that framing can be misinterpreted. I'm gonna try to interpret him in the most charitable way when he says that they lost holding the city when it means to they got pushed out of the city. They did lose that because they were pushed out of the city. When we say lose a war of attrition, that, that makes me lose the battle of attrition. I wanna be clear that the Ukrainians lost a lot less soldiers than the Russians did. And we do know, and we can even look back in Russian history, how you can trade land for time, trade land for lives, and the Ukrainians decided to trade 10 months of, uh, 10 months of time fighting around Bakhmut for a very small amount of land as they bought time for a spring counteroffensive or for a counteroffensive that we're still anticipating. So a defeat, yes. But when people talk about a major defeat, it, it, I think it's dishonest. And I, I understand somebody could be like, oh, Dylan, you know, you're being a little cherry pick here. It was a defeat. It was a defeat when it comes to them holding the city. They no longer hold the city. They lost the city. But we call it a major defeat. It, those are the types of words I would use to describe the Kharkiv counteroffensive for the Russians. That was a major defeat because they got pushed out of the entirety of the Kharkiv Oblast because the front line just broke. Uh, the Kherson counteroffensive was a major defeat for the Russians because they lost the only provincial capital that they captured for the entirety of the 2022 invasion. That was a, was a major defeat because they lost the city of 440,000 people, 450,000 people, as well as thousands upon thousands upon thousands of square kilometers of territory. But then you compare that to Bakhmut, and yeah, it's a defeat, but it's not even in the same category. Especially when the Russians themselves are starting to question whether this fight was worth it. It's actually a Pyrrhic victory for Russia. Maybe, I mean, certainly they lost a ton of people yeah. taking the city. I'm not saying it's to their benefit really at all. I mean. Then how can we call it a... How do you call something a major loss and then immediately say this is a major loss for the Ukrainians? Now, I'm not saying it's even beneficial for the Russians in any way. It may be a fearic victory and it really it doesn't benefit them at all. Well, then how is that a major loss? Then the, the best interpretation then would be that it was basically like it was a wash. And if it was a wash, that means the Russians expended how much resources in a wash? Because he was talking about how much resources the Ukrainians spent in Bakhmut. The Russians spent three to four to five times more resources trying to take Bakhmut, which is expected when you're an attacker. Attackers spend more resources. And traditionally, when we're talking about traditional military forces, spend more lives. I, this is such weird commentary. Like, why, how can you say it's a major defeat before then saying it's actually might, might be of no benefit to the Russians whatsoever? Yeah, I don't think any of these people should be dying anyways. But there's a reason that they were fighting over this city in the first place. David Sachs actually had a pretty good summary. Number one. <laughs> I'm sorry, dog. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. David Sachs has never said anything correct about Ukraine. Everything he says about Ukraine either gets proven directly false or has yet to be proven directly false. Every prediction he makes, every estimation he makes, it always ends up being wrong. So let's see. Let's see how important it is. One, Bakhmut is a regional transport and logistics hub. It gives Russia now access to roads and to rail, and it places larger cities within easier range of Russian artillery. I'm sorry, but okay. This is, I, I, oh, I feel like I'm about to be a little mean here, but I don't know how else to react to this. Does anybody have some like recent footage of Bakhmut? Just like, I'm, I'm trying to see if I have anything recent in my uh, DMs or, or anywhere, like just recent footage from Bakhmut. Because if you look at Bakhmut right now, let's see if I can just Bakhmut. See, just if I can get some just footage or, or some pictures of Bakhmut. Google Maps? I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, like, I, one second, let me just wait for this to load. Unless somebody wants to link it. Oh, is there any? Yeah, here it is. Here's the footage I was looking for. Look at this footage of Bakhmut. 
Look how destroyed everything is. And by the way, this isn't even like the most up-to-date footage. There's still a, a little bit out of date. There's been more fighting since this footage was taken. But this is generally the, the current status of the city. When you look at the current status of the city, it's hard to imagine there's much infrastructure at all for it to be a logistical hub or for it to be used for anything. This would be like saying, like the, like you completely wipe, you know, wipe out, uh, 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 like a, like a, like a dairy stand. You go to a dairy stand, you destroy, you burn it to the ground and then you've captured it. And then afterwards it's like, great. I can, I can make, I can sell dairy now. Not really. The dairy stand's gone. The city's gone. How are they going to use this for a logistical hub? The city no longer exists. It no longer exists. It's going to take tons of repairs for them to fix up the city enough for it to be used as a, an effective logistical hub. Not to mention the fact that it's going to be a frontline city, which is going to make it even more difficult to use it as a logistical hub. So they've got to rebuild a frontline city from literally ashes to then use it as a logistical hub. So that, that, that threat of Bakhmut being used as a logistical hub ended about like six months ago. Not even, this isn't even a recent development. It ended like six months ago because I remember asking somebody um, during the, like the second or third month of the Battle of Bakhmut, like, what is the usefulness of Bakhmut? And they told me, well, it could be used as a logistical hub, but the more that fighting co continues, the, the less and less likely that is because the city's just completely being wiped off the face of the earth. Which is exactly why Zelensky and his government didn't want them to take it in the first place. Number two. It well, but that again, that threat ended like two, three, four months in. Has unique defensive fortifications. They have a network of subterranean salt mines and tunnels, 100 miles, which is what contributed a lot. The salt mines that he's talking about, that's the Solidar salt mines. And that was captured like five or six months ago. So I don't know how them delving into another six months of room by room, building by building combat in Bakhmut itself contributes to them holding on to the salt mines. To its defensibility, and it provides an underground complex to stockpile weapons, munitions, and equipment, other lines of defense, but Bakhmut may have been very unique. Bakhmut itself, the idea of storing weapons in Bakhmut itself right now, again, just look at any pictures or photographs of Bakhmut. For Ukraine, the idea also is what I just pointed out. This was their moral stand. This yeah. was their like. See, this is the only legitimate thing he's talking about. This is their moral stand. We're saying it's a major loss. Well, what did Ukraine majorly lose <laughs> morally? Their morals, their 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 uh, morale has just crashed and, and burned. But we see the Ukrainian armed forces sponsoring an, an invasion into Russia itself right afterwards. I don't feel a, a, a huge blow in the stomach here in Ukraine proper. Most people view Bakhmut now as a sword that the Russians fell on, losing tens of thousands of its own soldiers and a ton of resources to buy time for Ukrainian counteroffensive. That narrative of Bakhmut had already been written by the time the Russians captured the last building in the city itself. Putting that aside, 24 hours after the Russians announced capturing it, there's Ukrainian uh, groups being going uh, Ukrainian sponsored groups, Russian uh, anti Putinist Russians sponsoring a, a small incursion into Russia itself, which is now all the talk of the town as people have started to talk about Bakhmut less and less, just 24 hours after it being capturing, in an attempt uh, after it being captured, in an attempt to deliver a single victory to the Russians. Or big thing. Now, look, let's caveat it with this. This all could be part of a feint, right? They lose Bakhmut. Uh Air raid alert. So, um, some, if I have to step away for a second, you understand why. But they're pretending to be on the back foot, and this is all in the, you know, gearing up for a major spring counteroffensive like what they had last year. It's not even them pretending to be on the back foot. A back foot. Again, if you look at how much land they've lost over the last 10 months, the Ukrainians aren't the ones that are upset with the results. All you have to do is go on the Russian military telegram channels and check out how they're talking about the Battle of Bakhmut, how it went, the battles for Volodar, the battles for Avdivka, these other locations that the Russians are going to have to capture that are extremely difficult and they have no immediate hope of capturing them. They're not capturing them in the near future. That are locations all across Ukraine, just like Bakhmut, which they can't just 
Bakhmut every battle of just doing human wave tactics after every single for every single city they capture. I, I think we did the I, we did the math off camera off stream for how long it would take for Russia to capture all of Ukraine at the current pace of the pace of the last ten to twelve months, and it would be I think well taking out the amount of land that they've lost it would it would take till about I think twenty ninety or twenty eighty them to capture all of it they're not just not capturing enough territory and the amount of the, the the price that they are paying for the territory they're capturing is too high sir i want to i want to be very clear it very possibly could be something like that but um one other theory that is out there is that Russia actually may have used Bakhmut as a trap crystal to lure Ukrainian troops and generals, causing them huge casualties and possibly imperiling their ability for the counteroffensive. And you know why I'm thinking? I, I, that, I, I, that, just, that just seems like pointless speculation. Do, do we have any evidence of that? Thinking that or why I think that there is some credence because U.S. generals told them this months ago yeah. put this up there on the screen this is from cnn okay and it shows you you know the laundering of the deep state press but they're like the u.s and its allies want ukraine to change its battle tactics in the spring because they are pointing out that the ukrainians have poured <clears throat> massive amounts of our u.s taxpayer provided aid into this battle they lost a ton of people it's been a brutal war of attrition and at the end of the day russia has an industrial base and can draft as many people as it wants and ukraine is <laughs> It's not that simple. Is that really? I'm so, I would yeah, I would think if you're like a libertarian esque conservative, the idea that you can just draft people endlessly and they'll never fight back. The Soviets thought they could do that in Afghanistan and it didn't work. Eventually you will push your people to a breaking point. If that was the case, that they can just endlessly draft people forever, then why have the Russians uh halted themselves from occurred. doing full mobilization? Flemmy has donated five dollars. I think the title of this video is self-referential. And, and by the way, Flemmy, thank you so much for the $5. And I'm not even saying that if they were to go full referendum, that would cause like a revolution or anything. I'm just saying that it's not as simple as the Russians just need to like, you know, up the tab of the amount of people they're recruiting. And a lot of areas where the Ukrainian counteroffensive succeeded, the localized one near Bakhmu, where they crushed the northern and uh, southern flanks of, of the uh, Russian positions, making it so that there was no threat of Russian encirclement anymore as the Ukrainians withdrew from the city. Uh, the positions they were attacking were swarming with Russian recruits. They, were, they had a lot of Russian recruits, but the quality of those recruits were very low. And in some areas, the amount of uh, Russian soldiers to Ukrainian soldiers is quite high, but the Ukrainian soldiers are able to perform quite well because of poor equipment, poor training, and a lot of times just poor cooperation and poor communication between Russian military units, which are often competing against each other or have rivalries like the Wagner Group and other PMCs or the Russian Ministry of Defense or other units with special commando units. So whether or not they can just endlessly recruit more and more people, if that, if that was uh, the only factor that mattered in deciding who would win a war or not, then you would think America beats Vietnam because America has a larger Burns population than Vietnam. Immoral, you would say Soviet Union beats Afghanistan. Man. Soviet Union has a larger uh, uh, population than Afghanistan. America beats Afghanistan because America has a larger population than Afghanistan. But it's not that simple. It isn't that simple. Uh, Flemmy, thank you so much for the $5. I appreciate it. I think somebody else subbed or donated, and it didn't come up on my screen exactly who that was. Let me see. General Mark, thank you so much for the tier one being so for 10 months. Long live the Belgorod People's Republic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Also, it is true that the American government wanted the Ukrainians to withdraw from Bakhmut because they thought it wouldn't be worth it. And they, in large part, were afraid of, and this is the big, big, big reason why they wanted to withdraw from it. They were fearful of the Ukrainians being encircled. Now, you can debate whether or not the uh, it was worth it. I would say... Probably yes, considering that they isolated a lot of the destructions that the Russians uh, wrecked upon the country into a, into a specific area uh, around Bakhmut for the last 10 to 12 months. That's not to say they didn't, well, mostly 10 months. That isn't to say they didn't attack other areas, but they concentrated the Russian offensive capacity in that area, buying them time for a spring offensive, buying them time for their eventual counteroffensive. They, they bogged down the Russians. And not only did it succeed in that factor, but they also didn't get encircled. 
There was no encirclement. The big risk that the American government talked about uh, of, of the Ukrainians getting encircled in Bakhmut didn't happen. And with the counteroffensive, uh, the localized counteroffensive north and south of the city, there's now no risk of encirclement. And there wasn't as they withdrew from the city. Burns is so in, in they morally uh, they wrought uh, extremely high casualties upon the Russians. They bogged them down for the entirety of their winter offensive, and they concentrated their offensive capacity in a specific section of the country, um, which is much less than both the Kharkiv counteroffensive, the Kherson counteroffensive, or the Kiev counteroffensive. I think that there's a good argument to be made that the Ukrainians, while maybe they didn't need to pay as much of a toll as Burns they had in, in, in Bakhmut world, and they maybe could have withdrew sooner uh, that the battle for Bakhmut uh, could be definitely if the counteroffensive comes and is successful a contributor to Ukrainian success because they were able to hold the Russians back for 10 months which is extremely surprising considering again it's a city of around 70,000 people pre-war hey I saw Vosh raided thank you for the Vosh raid and I'm seeing all these subs coming in Thank you, everybody, like any 43 for the tier one sub being sub for 33 months. Uh, Trippy Gamer for the tier one sub. Vosh Ray Dylan, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for the subs and all the support. I appreciate it. My goodness. Derp again, thank world. you for the primer Probably being sub for eight months. Currently on a one month streak. Eight months, let's go. Uh, Eurosaurus 89 Arctos, thank you so much for the primer. Disaster Nick for the Prime, Locky for the Prime as well, 35. Burns Flemmy just gifted five tier one subs to Unical Fabasta in Chunk Naga. Oh, uh, Sister Midnight and Bluestone. Thank you so immoral, much, Vosh Bad. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the five gifts of tier man. ones. I appreciate it. I'm never going to even attempt to pronounce that name again. That was too close. That was too close. <laughs> That's too close, Burns man. Burns is an immoral, morally corrupt bank. Man, a lot man. of Vosh Raiders. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What did you say? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, I appreciate all the gifted subs. I appreciate all the subs. I really do. Um, all your subs, occurred, all your gifted stuff occurred. goes towards me trying to keep doing this freelance journalism in Ukraine. So Vosh I do appreciate bad. it. Flooding chat with white names. See this guy? He was coping the other day. Oh, boy. Come on, Twitter. Load my oh this guy dude this guy is the one of the worst Austin accounts on Twitter. This guy's terrible. Tiger Don't Fox listen to anything he says. He pushes bullshit all the Victory time. Just the like verifiably people. false info. Verifiably false info. Does it all the time. Tiger Fox King, thank you so much for the tier one sub. Victory to the Ukrainian people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see some other subs coming in here as well. I think oh uh, no that was Fleming as well. Man, you guys are really supportive today. I really appreciate it. Voss sent us. Well, like, thank you, Vosh. I appreciate it. Now I am by law required to submit myself to his, uh, his polycule. That's how it works. That's how it works. Sorry. That's just how it works here. Anyway, but no, this, this guy sucks. This guy's fucking terrible. Don't listen to anything he has to say about Ukraine ever. If you do, you will become stupid. Okay. Let's continue with the breaking point segment. The terrible breaking point segment on Ukraine. Let's continue is a wiped out country with no industrial base, no currency, completely propped up by the US and the Western allies, basically at the charity of our taxpayers. They have nothing um, and they would fold instantly as opposed to where the Russians are. So if you look- I mean, this is again, like very silly. It's silly to think that if America was to drop its support tomorrow, Ukraine would just collapse in on itself. I think the Ukrainians showed in the first month of the war when everybody thought Ukraine was going to collapse and we did not send large amounts of aid. We just sent javelins and a few and law and stuff like that because we were fearful that anything we give them would simply be captured by the Russians and then paraded on Russian state TV, flushing billions down the toilet. For that period of time, they defended and they stopped the Russians in villages across the country, not only through the official armed forces of the country, but even th through territorial defense and local units and people just grabbing their guns and going out there and firing at the Russians and forcing them back. And the idea that without the United States, that resistance would just die out as if they are solely propped up by the United States, that their will to fight itself would not be enough stop the Russians from capturing the whole country or, or or conquering Ukraine is silly. Definitely since we've already given them large amounts of aid that would certainly help them in any continued defense of the country. Would they perform worse? Yes. Would the war possibly last a lot longer, uh, meaning we would be restricting Ukrainian victory? Maybe. 
Could it mean that the war would be shorter because the Ukrainians would feel like they were in a tougher position to have to negotiate signing away thousands upon thousands of lives in occupied territory? Maybe. We don't know. But the idea that the Ukrainians are solely being propped up by the United States is silly. Definitely since they were able to defend themselves for the first month, largely using non-NATO weapons. Look at the long-term prospects on this. This is not a good sign. Well, it's this, not good for them. This is right. what the U.S. was trying to pursue. I, again, I don't know how you can use Bakhmut to extrapolate anything outside of, wow, that took a while. That should have taken the Russians a lot shorter. That was a crazy, deadly, destructive battle. Like, more than that, I don't know what else you can extrapolate from it. Like, all of the strategic benefits he said that Bakhmut gives them, all of them are just not true. None of them. Either because the city is just too destroyed to give them the benefits of like what they're going to use it as a logistical hub. Yeah. Okay. Try to run, try to run some cars through those craters. Try to try to set up a logistical hub in Bakhmut. Good luck with that. Persuade them. It's right. basically like, look, y'all, a war of attrition. This yeah, is not a good lose. landscape for <laughs> you because Russia has massive industrial yeah. capacity. And if we were going to go all in with Ukraine in a war of attrition, we would be ramping up industrial good capacity. Point. Obviously, we're not doing that. We're just drawing down the stockpiles that we, we we are trying to ramp up shell production in the United States. It's just taken a lot longer than it should have, mind you. But we're also working with our allies to try to get more shells into the United States and into Ukraine. One example, which is not talked about often, is South Korea, which we made an agreement with recently for them to ship us 500,000 shells to replenish American stockpiles. So that frees up more shells to also be sent over to Ukraine. Should we be doing more to ramp up shell production? Yes. Are the Europeans doing more to ramp up shell production? Yes, but again, not enough. But again, like the idea, and this is the problem I have, is that Russia has more capacity in its industry. Therefore, in, in the long haul, Russia is just going to win. Therefore, negotiate now. This ignores a lot of information. Number one, a lot of the information you're going to be working on based off of to, to talk about Russian industrial capacity comes from Russian government reports. And Russian government reports are purposely manipulated to make them look better. This has been shown multiple times by multiple investigative reporters, NGOs, different uh, press organizations. Uh, it's not really even a debatable point. They manipulate these numbers all the time. Now, that in and of itself is not enough to say that we can completely disregard it. And I don't think we should completely disregard it. It can produce shells. It can produce vehicles. But the vehicles that are being produced, they're going to have to find substitutes for Western parts that they can no longer import due to sanctions. A lot of the safety standards that are usually applied are being removed. Planet of Hats has donated $6.90. What a couple of weaselly little liars, dude. They're just chugging Kremlin talking points straight from the jug. Thank you for the $6.90. 69, lamal, 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 funny number. Um, a lot of the problems with the Russian defense industry is the fact that they just can't hire enough people because that the pay they're offering is garbage. People sign up thinking they're going to get much better pay, find out they're getting garbage pay, and then they leave unable to retain staff. And the few people who are getting paid are only are the people who have been on for years and years and years and are extremely specialized, a lot of which have fled the country over the last year and a half because they don't want to be affected by the Western sanctions. The ones who do stay, they get to have decent pay, but the problem is they don't have enough staff. And to recruit more staff, they need to pay them more, but they're not willing to pay them more. And a lot of times, the bonuses that are supposed to go to these employees, many of which are already not getting paid enough, is explicitly is being taken back from them by the organization, by the military companies that they're working for in a quote unquote voluntary transaction where they're giving them back their pay as a donation to the firm. They're just not running a successful military industrial complex, quote unquote, if you were a 21st century well-functioning military force. If it was true that Russia's military capacity was enough was enough to just win them the war, then why haven't they won the war? If they can just produce all these tanks and shells to make up for shortages, why are the Russians reporting shell hunger? Why do we have Yevgeny Prigozhin going on Telegram and having to beg publicly 
for shells, for artillery shells, for him to continue his counteroffensive. Why are we seeing older and older Russian vehicles from the Soviet Union getting brought out if they can simply make new T-90Ms or T-14 Armada super tanks? Why is it? Because the Russians are pumping up their chest about how strong their military capacity for you know military production is. They're not hitting their quotas. Not only are they not hitting their quotas, they're not hitting production quotas. They're not hitting employment quotas. They're not. They're not. They're. They are failing to produce the amount of weapons that would be necessary them necessary for them to sustain the offensive, for them to capture these other positions like Kramatorsk, which is going to next, which is going to be the next target for the Ukrainian for the Russian army if they were to actually continue their offensive, which we don't see any evidence of them continuing their offensive in the in the near future to capture these locations. But when they do, they don't have the uh, military capacity, the military production capacity to support it. Now, maybe it's taking them, it's going to take them more time to ramp up. Maybe they find solutions. Maybe they fix the employment problem. It is true they have more military capacity than Ukraine. It is true that they have more military production capacity than Ukraine. But that hasn't been enough to say, salvage their invasion of Kiev their occupation of Kherson or their occupation of Kharkiv. So why would it be enough for them to salvage the war? We already have. So um, you have both sides in this Bakhmut battle claiming that their goal is basically to turn it into a meat grinder for the other side and to, you know, wear them down so that they're in a stronger position here for whatever offensive or whatever action is to come. Um, but that cannot, you know, so even though Ukrainians are saying like, oh, this was our goal all along, which is mm. to, to wear down the Russians so that we're in a stronger position. But, um, you know, ultimately you have to say the side that won the battle probably is likely to have taken fewer losses, is likely to be in the stronger position moving forward, certainly has won a prize that is of some strategic value. And Dog, did she go to school? <laughs> I'm sorry. That was really mean. That was really mean. But like, I like, did she study this shit? Like what? Like, did she go to school for military history? Does she know? Like, did she study military? Why the fuck is she speaking about? Why is she talking about this? Like, actually, why is she talking about this? And I mean that in the like the most mean way possible. Like, what she just said was so unbelievably uninformed. The attacker in a battle is most likely to have taken less casualties because they won. What are you talking about? That isn't necessarily true at all. The, the, the standard, obviously, this changes depending on who's fighting who, the military capacity of both sides. But usually, the attacker takes more casualties because they have to attack an entrenched position run into like vulnerable positions. They have to run across open fields, throw their soldiers against entrenched positions. If it was if it was the case that the Russians were inflicting more casualties on the Ukrainians for the last eight months to 10 months of fighting in the Bakhmut area, why would the Ukrainians have stayed in the first place? Unless she's just back, she's just saying that the reason the American commentators, the American analysts wanted them to withdraw was because they were like secretly finding out about like higher casual. Like I have no clue where she would get this idea from. If you look at the Jack Textera leaks, the Jack Textera leaks, which I know that they covered on her show, clearly show that the Russians have taken more losses. The ratio that they estimated was that for every one Ukrainian that died, 2.5 Russians died. Uh, President Biden recently was talking about at a press conference about the astoundingly high casualty that the Russians take in Bak uh, taken in Bakhmut. Uh, there has been a lot of coverage about the astoundingly high casualties that the Russians have taken in Bakhmut. What makes her think that the Ukrainians took more losses? Now, I, I know I can, like, focus, focusing on this, um, you know, might seem like maybe like nitpicky to a few people, like hyper focusing on this one point when she said a few things. But one of the arguments they were just talking about was was the Ukrainian argument that it made sense for us to defend Bakhmut Burns because we could wear down the immoral, Russians. Morally corrupt, but bankrupt. Man. Her argument against that is that the Russians probably took less casualties, which she has nothing to support. She just, the only thing she said to support it was, well, they were the attacker who won, and since they won, they probably took less casualties. I mean, okay, the Soviet invasion of Finland. Who took, who took less casualties? 
Was it the Finns or was it the Soviets? The Soviets won. Who who took less casualties? I don't. I just. I don't know. It just feels like she's like illiterate on military history or military strategy. And I'm not saying you have to be an expert to talk about it, but if you don't know about it, don't guess about it. In terms of how the conflict unfolds, and then the other thing that is wild to me. I mean, keep in mind, this was the longest and bloodiest battle of the whole war. And this has been going on for mm -hmm. months. Yeah, well, eight the, months. Uh, the amount of, of manpower, the amount of deaths, the amount of material that was used here is quite astonishing. So now for the media to buy the line of like, oh, it's really no big deal. Pyrrhic victory, right. no problem. I mean, that's just, that has to be dishonest. <laughs> that is like really obvious. I, I don't know if she genuinely believes what she's saying or she's just uninformed. I'm just, I'm just going to lean towards uninformed dishonest that they've been talking about this for months they've i saw headlines even last week they're, but they, they've been talking about the the lack of strategic significance for months in the article that they pointed on the screen it was american officials talking about how bakhmut's just not worth it it's not that strategically important in seeger the person right next to her was just talking about earlier that i don't even know if the russians got anything out of this so people saying it's not that significant when your co-host Right next to you said it might not be that significant. I mean, he was kind of swinging everywhere. Why didn't you call him out when he said that then? Do you disagree with your co-host that it couldn't have been that significant? That it might have not been that significant? I think they were like, the Ukrainians are doing well. They're gaining ground, et cetera. Yeah, read it here. And then, right. you know, and yeah. then days later, it's like, well, it looks like they lost. But it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Everything is still going according to plan. So um, it also, I think, reveals a lot of media dishonesty oh, as well. Incredible. I mean, it is stunning, actually, to behold. And, you know, stunning. I mean, even now I'm stunning. reading, they're like, as Yabakhoek slips, Ukrainian forces push to encircle the city. You know, they're doing their best to try and retake some of the ground. So, of course, look, it's not over. Now they want to make Make the Russians suffer because they're going to have to hold the city after they took it, and it would be a bad look, of course, if they were able to. So I'm not saying that the battle is over or any of that in any way. More though, they are the ones who spent thousands of men, bi billions of dollars of ammo and of artillery. <laughs> How does he know this? How does he know? Well, just of just ammo, of just artillery of just artillery in this one city. Do we know that? Do I like, I just, I just don't know that. Like, I'm sure we spent billions of dollars in military equipment, but I don't know billions and specifically artillery. Where does he get these numbers from? On defending this city. So then you can't turn around and tell us that this was some major strategic victory, apparently right. for Ukraine. I mean, that's insane. I don't understand how he can in one, and nobody's saying it's a major strategic victory for Ukraine. It's not a major strategic victory for the Russians either. It's, I mean, he described it at least somewhat accurately earlier when he called it like a fear of victory. Like, yeah, the Russians won. They captured the city, but they did it at, at an immense cost to themselves. And the entirety of the winter offensive was basically spent of them trying to take the city of 70,000 people pre-war that is no longer able to be used as a logistical hub because it's been completely raised to the ground. The city no longer exists. And its most actual strategic importance uh, is in it the fact that it's a stepping stone. I, I don't know. It's like for a second, it felt like he got it. And then it just like kept going. Um, Where's that spring offensive we've been hearing so well, much okay, about look, too? That, on that one, I have no idea. But I do know this. They probably spent a hell of a lot of ammo and artillery on this uh, battle that Okay, now it's probably spent, not billion. Okay. Our generals were like, hey, you shouldn't do this because it's going to bleed away from that. And we don't have billions more dollars to send you. That's not the only reason they said that. The main reason they said that wasn't even, oh, it's going to oh, it's going to cost all this stuff to defend it. Because it, no matter what, the Ukrainians were going to have to stop the Russians somewhere. Some people don't realize that. Let's say the Ukrainians gave up Bakhmut like a month in. They, then they would just fight them at Chasov Yar. They would have to fight them somewhere. The big fear for American generals was encirclement, which didn't come to pass. Now, of course, like maybe the, there was arguments of, well, Chasov Yar is more defensible because a higher position. You can make those types of arguments for it. But the main argument American officials made was about encirclement, which, again, did not come to pass. You know, our Congress, we're in the middle of a debt ceiling fight. Right. There ain't another 50 billion coming your way. Which could be the right. reason why Biden caves at this point for F-16s.
because yeah, I think you might. You know, right. I mean, this is and this is always the the logic as pointed out by our friend uh, Bronco mm. Marsatic, which is if Ukraine is doing poorly, you know, just lost the battle of Bakhmut. It's right. all right. We gotta we gotta back them up so that they can gain leverage, so that they're in a better position for whatever negotiations may theoretically come down the line. And if they're doing well, then it's like, oh, look, they can win. Let's give them more so that they can, you know, just yes, give them more support in every scenario. I agree. Just take back their territory yes. altogether. Awesome. Both roads lead to us sending more, doing more, escalating more, and wow! It seems it seems like, by the way, escalating more. What's Russia going to do? What are they going to do? Invade Ukraine? Uh, it almost seems like sending more aid to Ukraine seems like the most obvious solution. <laughs> it's just it just appears to be an endless cycle. So um, you know, no way to know if that's the reason why F-16s have been um, proffered at this particular juncture. But I don't think it's crazy to imagine that either. There we go. Who knows? Uh, we'll keep everybody updated. Hey guys. Okay. There we go.